that's recording. There we go. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you and call to order the October 13th Port Orchard City Council regular meeting. Pursuant to the governor's stay uh, at home and stay in safe order, the city will council will be conducting this meeting via Zoom. The Zoom link and call in numbers have been uh, posted to our website and, uh, and, the, and on this evening's agenda. So with that, would you please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. A little flag has come in handy this year. Uh, let's see here. We have a published agenda. Uh, are there any amendments or, uh, or additions to this evening's agenda that anyone would like to see? Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the agenda as published. Second. Motion by Councilmember Claussen, a second by Councilmember Kachardi to approve the agenda as presented this evening. Any discussion of the agenda as published? Hearing none, all in favor of approving this agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. We are to our first citizen comment period, and I see no members of the public uh, this evening on our, on our Zoom meeting. So we have a second citizen comment period later in the evening. Maybe we'll have somebody join us by then. We are to our consent agenda, and uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Mayor, I'd move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay. Um, I I think I got a motion by Councilmember Kachardi. I think that second was by Councilmember Clausen. And uh, any further discussion of the consent agenda? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the consent, consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, the consent agenda has been approved. We have a presentation this evening from our finance director, Noah Crocker. He's gonna to talk to us about revenue sources. So Noah, I bet you wanna share your screen. I would love to, thank you, Mayor. You're breaking up there a little bit. Can you hear me now? Uh, a little better. A little more volume would be nice. Okay. I am going to start off this evening's presentation by uh, reviewing where we're at in the calendar of the biennial budget development. You might wanna put that microphone a little closer to your mouth. We're still not hearing you very well. Is that, is that any better? Much better. Okay. There we go. Just going to have to sideways this thing. All right. Uh, so I want to start off tonight's evening by first reviewing the calendar of the biennial budget and where we've come so far. Uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen, which shows the uh, budget calendar, which we have developed um, back in June. And so we, are, we have climbed our all our way, all the way to October. Uh, we have accomplished all the goals of meeting with the department and the mayor uh, developing his budget and having that published October 1st um, and made available to the city council as well as the public. Uh, we met with the finance committee on October 5th to review the preliminary budget. And here we sit tonight uh, for the council meeting uh, to review a presentation on the revenue sources and um, talk a little bit about the property tax. Again, the revenue sources presentation will lead to our October 27th council meeting where we'll have a public hearing on revenue sources and a pro adopt a property tax levy. Um, and this year is a little bit different as we'll also uh, be asking the council to adopt a substantial need ordinance uh, so we can collect the full 1% of property tax increases uh, for next year. Um, starting next week, we will uh, roll into our preliminary budget at study session for the full council to digest and discuss. And we'll also have a hold a public hearing next week on the public, uh, on the preliminary 21-22 um, budget hearing. Again, the 27th, we'll hold a public revenue, uh, public hearing on the revenue sources and hopefully uh, adopt the ordinance for the property tax levy that night. Then starting in November, we are going to bring forward the financial policies, which we discussed earlier in the um, budget calendar uh, for full council to ratify and adopt. Um, 
we will also bring forward the final proposed budget after uh, we get feedback from the council at the 20th session, as well as uh, any other comments in between now and the development of the final budget. So again, I just want to remind the council of the public hearing schedules that we have set forth uh, and that we've been talking about. So with that, I'm going to switch gears, hopefully smoothly transition to the presentation for tonight, um, which will be on our revenue presentation. Does everybody see that screen? Yes. Great. So again, tonight we will be having a presentation on the revenue sources uh, for the next biennial budget. Uh, this is to allow the council and public time to absorb the information prior to our preliminary budget presentation uh, and hearing next week. Uh, again, this presentation will lead to a property tax levy ordinance adoption on October 27th, and at which time we'll have a public uh, hearing on the property tax levy. Um, Uh, as required by RCW 8455120, we are required to hold a public hearing on revenue sources uh, for the general fund in order to set a property tax levy for uh, 2021. Uh, we will be having that public hearing on the 27th. Again, this meeting is to uh, prepare for that and give us some advanced conversation and discussion on the revenue. So as we turn our attention to the general fund, which includes our current expense fund and our street fund for the 21-22 biennial budget, uh, we focus first on our total tax revenue dollars. And when we look at the total tax revenue, uh, we have proposed a $20.858 million uh, over the two year period. Uh, in this slide, we identify three main taxing categories. Our sales tax budgeted at $10.575 million, representing the largest taxing source followed by our property tax at $6,110 million, representing the second largest taxing source, uh, and rounded off finally with our other taxing sources in the other taxes category. In this slide, we provide greater detail on the three main taxing categories budgeted. Uh, we identified how we have allocated by fiscal year and the percentages of the overall tax sources that each represents. Again, sales tax is the largest taxing source, representing nearly 50% nearly of our biennial budgeted tax revenue. Property tax represents the other 30% of our biennial budget tax revenue, again, with other taxes as a category making up the remaining 20%. Now, of the other, tax, of the other taxes category, we identify electric tax, uh, the telephone tax, and utility tax as the top three categories within other taxes, um, and that represents about 40% of the overall 20% of that category. Noah, can I ask a question? Sure. Could you go back to that? Why do you indicate a reduction in telephone tax between 21 and 22? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and we cover a little bit on future slides, but I'll answer the question here. We have seen a decline in our telephone tax revenue over the last four years. So even in our current biennial budget, we um, did develop a 1920 budget, which was less than our 17, 18 biennial budget. So telephone taxes are on the decline. Uh, they're gradual. And that's why you see a slight $10,000 decline from 21 to 22. Thank you. Everybody getting rid of those home phones. So on the next slide, uh, we complete the whole biennial revenue picture by adding in all sources of funding. These other sources, these other revenue sources are identified in the smaller uh, green pie chart with a total anticipated revenue of roughly $4,066,000. The top three categories of these revenue sources are intergovernmental, which represent uh, primarily federal and state grant revenue, uh, motor vehicle fuel tax, and, and paths and trails. Um, charges for goods and services is uh, roughly $778,000 uh, this biennial period, um, which consists primarily of planning and court fees. And this is a reduction in the budget due to year-to-day activity that we've uh, monitored for 2020 and anticipate will spill over into 21, uh, 2022. So goods and 
charges for goods and services we anticipate to be down. License and permits are at uh, 963,500. Uh, again, primary drivers for this are business licenses and building permits, which have uh, been on a, a nice steady increase. On this slide, we like to take a look at the comparison of the 2019-2020 budget with our proposed 21-22 budget. Uh, this, I think, gives you a little better perspective on, on the revenue differences in the biennial periods. You'll notice that the total tax revenue we are budgeting um, is an increase of 1.8% or roughly 2% increase. Um, sales tax is the largest uh, increase in that category, 4.2 um, by dollars. And then property tax, 6.43%. Um, other taxes, uh, and we'll come back to that, why is that a, in the, the declining position, there's a number of, of taxes um, that we are observing and anticipate that will continue to decline in 21 due to COVID activity. Focusing on the other, other category, um, intergovernmental revenue represents probably about 50% uh, of the revenue growth there. And that is due to our um, grant money from PFD. So 300,000 uh, dollars is what we are budgeting to receive from the PFD in the next biennial budget, which represents the significant portion of that growth over the prior biennial period. Licenses and permits is budgeted to increase by about 19%. Um, now charges for services for, are budgeted to, to decrease by about 12%. Again, uh, adult probation charges are down, municipal court fees are down, a number of those categories um, in the policing sector are down on the revenue front. Um, again, we attribute a lot of that to COVID-19. Um, some of that decline also did start um, with our, our judge and court administering new policies. Um, so while that was a slight, the COVID uh, really did um, have an impact on those revenues. Uh, similarly, fines and forfeits are budgeted to decrease by about 8%. Again, these are traffic infraction penalties, uh, criminal traffic penalties, and public defense revenues are all down. Um, and so we're forecasting uh, that to continue into 2021 if COVID continues to play a role. That's important to note that overall, uh, we are anticipating about 4% increase in revenue um, over the biennial period. So I'm going to pause there before, see if there's any questions before we move to the next categories. Questions no, for were the tax revenues um, down in um, 2019 and 2020 as well? I.e. charges for services and fines and penalties? Yes. That's primarily our court. Yes. Bars aren't open. There's fewer DWIs, fewer criminal activities being arrested for you. You've got a chief. I mean, if you want to speak to that at all, I mean, we're, you've got to be doing something pretty, pretty, you know, we're, we're trying not to, uh, to a certain extent, aren't you, aren't we chief? Uh, yeah. So there's a, there's a couple angles to this. So we have asked our officers to, um, in order to help protect the department so that we can still function to, focus more on life safety issues as opposed to um, smaller issues of traffic. The jail has also significantly reduced their population for COVID related reasons as well. So um, you combine that with the fact that a whole lot of people are not going anywhere and not uh, being out in public and, and us taking a step back to keep officers and staff safe. This is, this is what we're seeing. We would expect that to, to change over time as, as uh, restrictions lift. So we're also we're seeing a drop in revenue here. We're also seeing a significant drop in our expense. Our jail bill is also down. Is domestic violence incidences rising as well? Uh, we haven't seen a significant increase. Uh, I, would, I would need to have a, a little bit more time to be able to to see a data trend. Thank you. Yep. yep. Other questions for Noah on the revenue? Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. So the next slide I want to introduce, because this is something that we haven't done, at least since I've been here. Um, and I sent out uh, some information from MSRC, MSRC on the matter of 
uh, IDP and when uh, the IDP is below 1%, the, the implicit price deflator, uh, when it's below 1%, entities that are 2,000, or excuse me, 10,000 population and above uh, are limited to a property tax increase to the IPD unless they take action and adopt a, what we call a substantial need ordinance that um, allows us then to take the full 1%. So with this year's IPD at 0.6, 0.6%, um, we will need to do the substantial need ordinance to levy our full 1%. So I just wanted to give this council an opportunity to talk about that and uh, provide any questions that you would let, want me to bring back if there is anything. Um, when we look at the substantial need, again, this is property tax and we use property tax for both our general fund and our street fund. Uh, that is how we split up our property tax revenue. So the substantial need that we are identifying as part of this ordinance will be really to continue uh, to support our street fund. Uh, there's, uh, we'll talk about this again next week. There's a substantial need for street funding uh, to, to provide funding for our street preservation program, as well as we're observing uh, real declines in the motor vehicle fuel tax uh, revenue this, by, this fiscal year. Um, so these are a couple of the things that we would point to in the ordinance as uh, the need, the substantial need, and why we would support adopting a, sec a second ordinance to uh, tax the full 1% increase. No, a quick question. Is this an ordinance that would cover the two year of the biennial budget or do we have to do this annually? Yeah, great question. No, we would only do this annually. Uh, we adopt property tax levies annually. So this will be a one year um, ordinance just like every other year. And, and Sean, I'll call on you in just a second. And it also requires a supermajority. So it takes five council members um, to approve that. So Sean, your question? Yeah, I was going to say just for maybe ease of understanding for the council and any, anybody that may end up watching tonight's meeting, can you just talk about the dollars represented by taking this from 60% up to the full 1% or 0.6% up to the full 1%? Yeah, yeah. And, and, I think this is important where we need to be careful about when we throw out percentages because this is less than 1%. So it's 0.6% of a percent. And, and so when we looked at the um, levy amount, what that's going to represent, that represents about $11,000 in estimated revenue. Okay. So the difference between the 0 0.6 and the one. Um, so while it doesn't seem like a, a lot, um, as, as many of the finance committee know, as we develop this budget, um, in particular for the street fund, every every dollar matters. Thank you for that, Noah. And then on, on that too, it's a, it's a matter of compounding too and in future years. Well, absolutely. But I just didn't want people to think that this is a, a, a multi-million dollar decision. <clears throat> right. But it is important. Okay, I will continue on then. Uh, so next table, uh, we provide information on the historic property tax data and as well as 2020 tax levy to be adopted later this, this month. Um, again, as we built this budget, we factored in the full levy ability. So I just want to keep pointing that out. Uh, for 2021, we are proposing a property tax levy uh, amount of $3,041,000. Uh, it is important that Washington State actually has the most complex property tax methodology nationwide. And in Washington, as a budget-based system of property taxation, uh, this means as part of the budget process, the city, the city must establish the amount of property tax revenue needed to fund the budget. And again, this amount is then uh, called the levy. The city establishes the levy amount and the council will, the county will calculate their levy rate, rate required to raise that amount of revenue. The city will certify to the county by November 30th. And then for 21, we have identified a total of, again, 3,041,000 levy needed. Uh, both these are subject to actions taken by the fire district and library district, which are unknown at this time as they are also going through a budgeting process. So here's another table just to uh, illustrate the property tax over time. Uh, you see that we have seen some growth in property tax revenue collections. Uh, however, property tax collections in 2018 did not grow uh, significantly 
uh, due to the fire district levy lid lift and the library district's lid lift. Um, so again, we emphasize that as we don't know what the other taxing districts will do, but if they take their full levy, then it does have an impact on the amount of levy that the city can uh, receive. If you, if you note that 2011, 2012, I believe that was when uh, the ballot measure was passed and uh, we no longer collected the, the property tax for the library district and passed it on to the library. We annexed into the library district and that tax went directly to them. So it came, came off of our tax rolls. Yep, that is correct. Let's move on. This slide compares 21 to 22 and breaks down the total levy amount, uh, the 2,962 uh, was the final levied amount in 2020. 2021, we can collect an additional $9,629, um, but at this point we hit our lid. Uh, we then add in new construction to our tax dollars. Um, we do not anticipate any ex annexations at this time. Uh, so we do not factor that in. And then we always put an estimate of $10,000 for state utilities. Again, at this time, it's just a placeholder. When all is completed and calculated, we may not be able to collect this $10,000. Um, however, if it is not included in the living now, then there is an increase in value. We will not benefit from it. Uh, lastly, we are required by state statute to add in our refunds. Uh, this 15492 represents monies that were paid out to property owners after going through the dispute process. And we are required to levy that refund amount and share against amongst all our taxpayers. Uh, and this brings the total levy of $3,051,000 uh, $3, for 2021. Could you cover that again, why that, that's 0.39 instead of 1% in 2021, the, the increase and only $9,000? Uh, let's see if I can. It should be the addition to get it to the full 1%. That's the math going from the 0. 0.6 of a one percentage point up to the one percentage point. Gotcha. Well, what should it just be 1% if it, well, I guess we can't assume. No, because we hit our levy, historic levy lid. And so we can't go above that. And that's where that percentage flips. Um, I'm, I can, I don't have a good illustration on this slide, but I can make a note to prepare that uh, for our ordinance adoption to have a better description and illustration of the calculation for the lid lift, or not the lift, but the levy. So I'll make a note of that. And that's really an estimate, isn't it? Because we, we can't take action on that till next year. Is that correct? Well, we'll set the levy this year. Yeah, we'll set the levy this year, um, but we won't know the final levy amount until it's all tallied. But we will have to take action before we know, and this is our standard procedure. Uh, but the, by the time the county rolls around, they'll tell us next year where the levy amounts actually landed. So moving on to the retail sales and use tax revenue. Um, this, this is an interesting year uh, due to COVID ex uh, as far as what we want to forecast and use as our sales and use tax revenue. Um, the city receives 0.84% sales tax currently. Um, and let's jump right in here. So when we look at uh, the historic trends here from fiscal years and actuals estimated, 2020 shows we are on track through three quarters, we've collected about 82% of what we estimated. Um, we have experienced solid growth in actual sales tax revenue since 2015. Uh, and when we originally brought the preliminary budget to the finance committee um, to discuss the preliminary budget, um, there was a great discussion about the city's and council's appetite for sales tax revenue risk. And we since then increased the amount of sales tax uh, revenue we would anticipate receiving to we have till we have now five million two hundred thirty five thousand for twenty twenty one and five hundred five million three hundred forty thousand in twenty twenty two. Again, there was a good discussion. We increased it by about one hundred fifty thousand dollars 
per year and to be dedicated to our street fund for pavement preservation. Again, as always with sales tax, the big concern relates to the economy and COVID's impact, um, but we discussed and felt that this was um, a palatable level of risk and, and we felt that there was time within the biennial budget to review and reassess in the mid-year. Yeah, I would just add to that just to just to reinforce what you just said, Noah, at the, the finance committee, we talked about the value of having a biennial budget. So some of these risks um, can be mitigated just because of the, our ability to come back to the table and see additional data as we proceed down this two year timetable. And I think this table um, helps to illustrate the discussion that we had at the Finance Committee as this looks at 2015 and the actual growth that we've received uh, from then through 2019. Again, where we landed with our 2021 uh, sales tax revenue projection is less than 2019, um, but it is about 150,000 from where we started uh, when we started the budget process. And we, again, when we look at this and compare the first three quarters of 2019 against the first three quarters of 2020, we are showing a growth rate of 6.16%, uh, which, which is amazing with what has gone on this year. Um, that's, real, that's real growth. Um, it's also real growth in particular sectors of our economy, um, which I think isn't a surprise with uh, many projects being done, uh, construction jobs, um, and retail sales tax for furnishings and remodeling homes, a lot of that sales tax revenue has come into play and it's created a nice strong year for us in 2020. Um, for the 2020-21 biennial budget, we are budgeting a total growth rate in sales tax revenue of 4.24%. Again, many of the economic commentary that uh, we hear is about a slowdown um, anticipated to come in 21, um, also with higher probabilities of recession risk and multiple levels of concern for COVID. So we have we are approaching this revenue sales tax the much the same way we have in prior years uh, that we are budgeting for the upside potential with limiting limiting our downside risk. Uh, recognizing that people absorb information differently, uh, we just like to display the sales tax history on the graph. Uh, for those that are visual learners, it just showcases the bar that uh, Again, sales tax growth has been solid and reflects the variance in, in the years. And that concludes my remarks for this evening. Um, Again, we, we intend to hold the public hearing on the property tax levy on October 17th uh, for adoption. If the council does have any questions or would like me to cover something further at that meeting, please feel free to send me an email, let me know, and I'd be happy to do so. Noah, did you mean to say October 20th? Yeah, what did I say? 17th. Oh yeah, October 27th. 27th or 20th? 27th, we will hold the public hearing for the property tax levy. Okay. So October, two weeks. Yeah. In two weeks, yeah. Uh, next week, we will have uh, the public hearing on the preliminary budget, and we'll have a study session and discuss the whole preliminary budget, including revenues and expenditures, um, and then we'll follow up on the 27th and adopt the property tax levy. Okay. So, Noah, on your sheet a little earlier, you indicated that the hearing will be on the 27th and a special meeting on the 28th. Was that? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, a good catch. That's not what I intend. So um, on the calendar, uh, this is what you're referring to. Oh, that's the all day meeting for department. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. So we, we, our plan uh, was to confirm this with the full council members that the 28th would work for the all day um, special council meeting where we would um, look at each department's budget. Um, we had some uh, dates picked out with the finance committee. Just wanted to throw that day out to the rest of the council to see if that would work for them as well. Uh, so that's just a placeholder. Um, and again, we can tackle that next week after the preliminary budget discussion. Thank you. And nothing further from me, Mayor. All right, so we're just putting that budget meeting, holding that time in my calendar. So uh, if others could do that too on the October 28th, it'll 
various, probably this format and bringing various uh, department directors in uh, to talk about their budgets. So when will we know that that's the date? Um, unless somebody says it doesn't work, um, I think that's where we're headed. So we're kind of looking for input tonight from folks to make sure that the 28th will work. Mm -hmm. You've currently got a manager's meeting scheduled for that day at yep. nine, I believe. And I think I could, I think we could reschedule that if, if we okay. needed that time. Or we could go a little earlier ahead of the council. There's six budgets, so probably an hour a piece. Just like a typical Super Tuesday. So I'm not hearing anybody object to the 28th. So okay. So tentatively, we'll we'll work out a, a schedule and which departments. And you're welcome to come to all of it or the pieces that uh, that interest you. So um, I'll all just right. Let me know when that date is final, so I can uh, send a notice for a core notice. Yes. Well, it sounds like to me that that's the final date. So, sounds sounds like you're sending a quorum notice, and we just got to work out the times. Yeah, you just work out the agenda for that date. But council, we need to plan on it for those of you that are interested and available the 28th. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. That was never been easier. <laughs> the Zoom thing is working. So. All right, we're uh, to our next item, which is a, is a public hearing, adoption of an ordinance proposing revisions to the Port Orchard Municipal Code, chapters 3.48, multifamily property tax exemption. Mr. Bond. Yes, thank you. And item 6A also corresponds to item 7A in your packet. Um, so I'll do the staff report for both items. Um, in, in 2016, we adopted a multifamily tax exemption ordinance for the city of Port Orchard. And in that ordinance, we offered a 12 year and an eight year tax exemption for the construction of, of multifamily housing. The 12 year exemption required that the housing be affordable. Um, after uh, a little over four years since that was adopted, we have granted the exemption on one project that is now operating and providing affordable units, and a second project is currently under construction that has qualified for the multifamily tax exemption. What we've learned through these two projects is that the uh, due to the median income for Kitsap County, what constitutes an affordable housing unit based on the median income for Kitsap County is not that different from a market rate unit in Port Orchard. And uh, the other thing that we've learned is that the eight year exemption um, really doesn't, uh, isn't getting the city significant benefits um, in the way that we would like to see in terms of redevelopment, but also seeing a type of development that is consistent with our, our long range plans. So we've worked with the land use committee on this and have come up with a proposal that creates three different types of tax exemption with three corresponding maps. The first type of exemption is a type one and provides the 12 year exemption and is available in designated centers and has a higher bar for housing affordability in order to receive that tax benefit. Type two, the type two exemption is uh, really targeting specific properties for redevelopment where we have uh, either an underutilized site or a uh, a site that, that just needs some attention or uh, updating. So if you can incorporate affordable housing into a project, or I'm sorry, if you can just update that project, we are offering the eight year exemption if you construct multifamily housing. So uh, an example of this would be like the South Kitsap Mall site where um, that is, is in need of uh, some redevelopment and a refresh. And if housing was incorporated into the redesign of that site, um, they would qualify for a, a tax exemption on the multifamily portion of the project. Type three is the, <clears throat> the third type that we're offering is also an eight year exemption, but this is really targeting greenfield development within centers. And it seeks to provide uh, the tax benefit when you construct building types that correspond to our, our plans, for instance, in downtown or the Ruby Creek area, if you're providing the mixed use type buildings that either contain uh, a percentage of the ground floor as commercial with multifamily housing 
or if you provide a parking garage type structure uh, as part of your project, you can qualify for this type of exemption. So this proposal was uh, reviewed in detail at the September work study meeting. Uh, our, the city attorney did point out that a public hearing was required before we could adopt this. And so that's why it was um, removed from the last meeting agenda of September and moved into October so that we had time to, to adequately notice the hearing. And the staff recommendation tonight is to, to hold a public hearing. And then under item 7A, the recommendation is to approve the, uh, the proposed ordinance. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take those. Okay. With that, I will open the public hearing related to the proposed revisions to Port Orchard Municipal, Port Orchard Municipal Code, chapters 3.48, multifamily property tax exemption. And seeing no members of the public present, I will close the public hearing on the multifamily property tax exemption. With that, we will go to our uh, business items. The first is business item A, which is the multifamily pro property tax exemption that we just had a public hearing for. Mr. Bond, this is yours. All right, so the um, uh, I'm not gonna represent the staff report, but the staff recommendation on the ordinance is to uh, approve the ordinance as presented. Okay. Is there a motion? Council Member Diener. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve an ordinance adopting revisions to Port Orchard Municipal Code Chapter 3.48. Second. <clears throat> a motion by Councilmember Diener and a second by Councilmember Ashby. Are there any questions for Mr. Bond on this matter? I know we've had it at a work study, but we might have further questions. Okay. I'm not hearing any. I think these are good changes uh, that make this. Uh, property tax exemption more meaningful and also could uh, promote some of the types of development that we're, that we're wishing to see in our, in our city in locations uh, that uh, are prime for that. So with that, you'll be voting on the uh, uh, vision, revising chapters 3.48, multifamily pro property tax exemption. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. On to item B, which is adoption of an ordinance ad adopting amendments to Port Orchard Municipal Code 20.26 development agreements. Mr. Bond. Thank you. Chapter 20.26 of the Municipal Code currently contains standards and procedures governing the, the city's use of development agreements, which can be entered into between the city and applicants to provide flexibility in the application of development standards. The City Council, the City Attorney, and DCD staff have identified a number of proposed amendments to the existing code to clarify the standards that may be addressed in a development agreement to provide more specificity on the application and processing requirements and the, the decision type and to strengthen requirements for additional public benefit for development agreement extensions. These revisions have been incorporated into an ordinance for review and adoption. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on the proposed amendments to 20.26 on October 6, 2020, and voted to recommend that, that the City Council approve an ordinance adopting the amendments. The Land Use Committee also reviewed the amendments on October 7, 2020, and directed staff to bring the ordinance to the full Council for review and adoption uh, on, at tonight's meeting. The staff recommendation is to approve the ordinance adopting amendments to Chapter 20.26, and as some of you may not have uh, had a chance to review this yet, I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, the specific changes in the, the ordinance. Questions or Mr. Diener? Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt an ordinance of adopting amendments to chapter 20.26 for Orchard Municipal Code. <laughs> second. So, okay, I have a motion by Councilmember Diener. I have a second by Councilmember Ashby. I, I, I could see your lips moving, Council Member Lucarelli, but I wasn't hearing you. <laughs> so, so, mute button. So, yes. uh, um, questions, uh, Council Member Ashby? I yes, I, I would appreciate it, um, Mr. Bond, if you would review the changes you've made. Because, again, this didn't go to a work study, it, it went straight sure. from land use to a, a meeting. 
All right, so I'll go through this and reference the page numbers in your packet. So um, the ordinance is presented in strike through and underline. And the first change is to the table in 20.22, which is on page 105 of your packet. Uh, actually 106 of your packet, it, it spans multiple pages. And what we've done here is we have added a footnote and depending on whether a development agreement is consolidated with either a type three permit, such as a subdivision or some other type of permit, it, it could be a type one, two, three, uh, four or five permit, um, and, and the appeal processes vary with each permit type. In some cases, it goes straight to Superior Court. In other cases, it, um, it or in some cases, it's a LUPA appeal, and in other cases, it, it is a, a legislative type appeal. Uh, in addition, we've retitled the chapter. Um, previously, it was a, it said permitting and development approval, uh, development agreements, but it's, uh, the word permitting was removed from the title. Um, we, one of the, the big changes is previously our, our code did not say which elements could be changed by, by a development agreement. And so some of the references in the purpose and authority as well as um, in section 20.26020 on, on page 108, it actually lists the chapters that can be where deviations can be um, provided by a development agreement. And you'll see that some things are included such as design guidelines, but other things like stormwater, which courts have said you cannot, uh, you cannot extend vesting or, or deviate from those minimum standards uh, are not included. So, so we've given a, um, a complete list of those things which can be addressed via a development agreement. Um, also on page 107 and 108, um, it talks about what development standards are and um, what they are not. So um, moving on th through the agreement to um, page 109, um, it, it gives further clarification after it lists the code sections that can be changed via development agreement. It, it clarifies under what circumstances those changes can take place. Um, and it also, it, it further elaborates on the, the table of permit types in this section two decision type, um, where it talks about if a development agreement is consolidated with another permit, it, it gets processed according uh, to that, that permit type and would be appealed uh, differently in, in some circumstances. Um, we added a provision on page 110 that clarified that the full cost of of drafting and processing the development agreement shall be reimbursed by the, the owner or the applicant prior to uh, city council approval. Previously, we had addressed this in our, our city fee resolution, uh, resolution saying that a deposit was required for the development agreement, but we needed to make sure that there was uh, authority for charging uh, the, the full cost of the development agreement in this chapter. Um, another big change, and I mentioned this in the staff report, but previously, you could terminate or modify a development agreement, but we didn't have very clear procedures for how to extend an agreement. And a couple of the parties that we've been negotiating agreements with recently have expressed concern about the term of our agreement. And we really didn't feel comfortable offering a term that is longer than 20 years. And even 20 years is a, a pretty long time but we didn't want to preclude ourselves from granting an extension provided that the city received an additional benefit for that extension. So we have explicitly created uh, provisions so that the city council at its discretion can extend a development agreement in the future. Um, and one of the questions the planning commission had, we're, we're proposing 10 year extensions and that you can get two of those. Um, this may be an issue with the county courthouse project because they are proposing a, a phased project over 20 to 30 years. And so we're not quite sure what their timeline is going to be. We don't want to grant them more than 20 years initially, but I think that the council should retain the flexibility to, um, to consider an extension beyond that in the future. Um, the planning commission had suggested that we go to a five-year extension, but considering the amount of work it is to, to renegotiate some of these development agreements and, and we've been working on agreements with uh, various parties, 
it's, it takes enough time and resources from the city that, that a five-year extension is not worth the, the effort that it takes to, to get these things processed. I think that it's better just to have a 10-year extension and then not, not have to touch it uh, so soon after you, you just got done doing that work. Um, moving on in the packet to page 111, we've clarified the application requirements for requesting a development agreement. Um, we, because there are noticing requirements, we've asked that applicants provide um, mailing lists and uh, envelopes and stamped envelopes related to uh, sending out notices for the development agreement. And we've also, uh, and also a map that shows um, the properties uh, that, that need to receive notice. Um, finally, under appeals, I, I mentioned this earlier, but a type three decision, um, like a subdivision, will initially go to the hearing examiner and the hearing examiner conducts a public hearing on the subdivision. So if someone consolidates a development agreement with a subdivision, we are proposing that the hearing examiner be the person that hold the hearing on both the development agreement and the subdivision as a combined uh, proposal. And then the hearing examiner provide a recommendation to the city council for final action on the development agreement. In other cases, um, our code previously s indicated that the planning commission actually would hold hearings on the proposed development agreement if it was a legislative action. And because these agreements deal with issues that aren't necessarily related to land use, such as um, if, if we're negotiating financial considerations, um, we felt like the Planning Commission was being inserted into situations that were potentially beyond their sort of their, their um, mandate. And so we felt that it would be better to ensure that for development agreements only, the hearing would be held by the city council, except when it's a type three permit that goes to the hearing examiner. And um, along those same lines, the, I mentioned the appeal process being different. If, if a development agreement is proposed as a standalone agreement without an underlying permit or without a permit application filed at the same time, the appeal process is different than if it's consolidated with a permit and would have a LUPA appeal. And uh, the Land Use Petition Act uh, of Washington sets out the parameters for how you appeal a permit but development agreements, when they're all by themselves, are not considered a permit. They're considered a, a legislative action. And so in some cases, when it's consolidated with a permit, it's going to, it has a 21-day timeline for filing the appeal and has a very prescriptive process for how that appeal goes. If it's a legislative action, I think the count, Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the council has uh, quite a bit more discretion and also the appeal period is not, um, does not have the same constraints as a LUPA type action in terms of timing. Is that, is that correct? Correct, yes. So, so the, the ordinance is just being amended to sort of recognize that there are different paths that can be followed uh, with regard to um, proposing, amending, and approving um, development agreements. Um, finally, the end of the chapter on page 114, um, it does clarify that development agreements are, are discretionary. And so just because somebody proposes a development agreement, uh, council is not obligated to approve that, whether it's an extension, an amendment, or a new, um, a new agreement. And it also clarifies that unauthorized fees are prohibited. And um, some of the, the older things that we've inherited from the county have, uh, I think we've all seen uh, fee, some arrangements that sort of make you scratch your head. And so this is clarifying that, uh, that those types of arrangements are not permitted unless, there's, uh, unless they're authorized by state law or, or some other uh, provision of law. So I, I went through that kind of fast, but if you have specific questions, please uh, let Charlie or I know. I may defer to her if you have uh, something that is beyond my legal expertise. Councilmember Ashby, did we answer your all your questions related to that? Yes, I had read it, but I wasn't sure exactly. I wanted the clarification. I appreciate that, Nick. I also appreciate the work your department has done on this and the preceding action we took on the multifamily um, tax exemption. Th that particular body of work was important after we had had a couple of 
projects go through and we saw what worked and what could be improved. So anyway, I really do appreciate um, what your department's been doing for us. Thank you. Thank I also you. want to extend, since I, since I have the floor, um, to compliment Noah and his department on the information they provided us on the budget. Um, the Finance Committee has received a little more than the full council has, and I have found it very helpful and easy to understand. So I appreciate that a great deal. Thank you, Noah. Yeah. Councilor Chang, you raised your hand. Yeah, um, Noah, you mentioned the, the terms of the 10-year extensions, and I was actually intrigued by the previous page where you're saying that the, and I don't mean you personally, but um, uh, the development agreement would be limited to 20 years. Um, what, in your memory, at the top of your head, would you say is the average term of a developer agreement? Is 20 years on the long side or short side? I think it's probably on the long side across the realm of development agreements in all jurisdictions. We have inherited some unusually long development agreements. One of them, uh, the McCormick Agreement for Transportation, actually doesn't expire until 15 years after the final of 10 projects is constructed. And that agreement is already almost 20 years old and we're probably 60 years from the current agreement expiring. So, um, but it, it really depends on when certain projects are actually constructed. Um, I, we have quite a few that have a 20 year term and we've had a few development agreements that actually didn't specify a term, which is also problematic. So um, th that's why it's important to have a limit in our code so that nothing in the future get approved gets approved that um, will be uh, a will be hiding in wait for for my successor someday to uh, cause them all sorts of problems. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Diener, did you raise your hand? Yeah, so I also wanted to thank uh, staff for the work that they've done on this. And at the Land Use Committee, I brought up the idea that, that a 20 year plus 210 seemed like an awful long time. Um, it was pointed out that even the, those extensions are discretionary in nature. Um, but my observation is that once you have the opportunity for two 10 years, it's kind of hard to walk it back if you've already given one of those. Um, but that's really something for us to think about. Um, and then I have a question on page 114 under two or 2026060. Should we modify the language so that it reads the decision of the city council to approve or reject a request for a development agreement, including any subsequent extensions, shall be a discretionary legislative act? And so on. I, I don't see an issue with that. Although if you're going to talk about extension, you sh extensions, you should also talk about amendments. So um, the decision of the city council to approve or reject a request for a development agreement, uh, including an amendment or extension shall be discretionary. Something, something like that. I think Charlie and I could, uh, could clarify that if you wanted to make it an amendment. Yes, uh, could we make that an amendment please? Would you like me to read that into the record? Yeah. So you Please, please do. The decision, uh, the amendment would, would read, revise 20.26060 to read, the decision of the city council to approve or reject a request for a development agreement, including any subsequent amendments or extensions, shall be a discretionary legislative act and an exercise of the city's police power and contract authority. Perfect. I have a, I have a motion. Do I have a second for that amendment? I'll second. Okay, I heard a second by Councilmember Clausen. The, the amendment was by Councilmember Diener. Did, Brandy, do you catch capture that? I did. Okay, discussion of that amendment. Councilmember Clausen, did you raise your hand? No, I have another question, but not on the amendment. Thank you. Okay, but not on the amendment. All right. So we'll be uh, voting on the amendment. If there's no further questions, all in all in favor of the amendment by Council Member Diener, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The amendment is approved. Council Member Clausen, do you have a further question on the main motion? Yeah, I do. In the award of uh, extensions, is it 10 years or not at all, or does the council have discretion to, for whatever reason, go with something different than 10 years? Oh. 10 years is the, the cap. 
Um, so the council has absolute discretion to set an extension at whatever length of time it feels comfortable with. Um, but 10 years, I believe, would be the cap um, in, in increments of two. And, and does that include the initial DA term as well? You could award a 15-year DA instead of a 20-year. Correct, yes. So the only thing with those extensions, as Nick pointed out, it's taking years to negotiate because we want benefit for those extensions. And then all of a sudden you do, you spend three or four years develop, negotiating something and for a five-year extension and it just takes a lot of le our legal time and our staff time to, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah, there's always that issue of, you know, progress being shown or something of that nature that might come into the discussion. Yep, I hear you. <clears throat> Other questions, comments about uh, the main motion? All right, Councilmember Diener. Well, I just wanted to, to hear if anybody else had any discussions about the, the length of two 10-year extensions possibility. No. Or was I, that a concern to sense. anybody else? Well, I was uncomfortable with the 20 year. So the 10 the year also seemed a little excessive. Um, I can under I, I am hearing what um, Nick's saying about after all the negotiations, um, five year may seem too frequent. But, um, and I don't know if there's another way to word it. It just, I think if you looked at it, you would expect a 10, a 10 year extension. Um, it Even clearly says time. up to a length, or, or I'm sorry, for no more than a length of 10 years. So I, I think it implies it could be two years or five years or seven years or 10 years. That's okay. why I wanted a clarification on it was to know that the councils have that flexibility. And I like the 10 year term. I mean, these things are, are massive in nature and think back what happened with the last recession back in 2008, 2009, and you lose six, seven years worth of developments. And all of a sudden the developer gets going again and there's only three years left on their clock. I mean, it just, it, it's not offensive to me at all. So Sean, you said you like the, the 10 year term. Do you, do you like the two 10 year terms? I, I do, because I think there could be, you know, I think McCormick's a great example. It's such a massive, it's one of the largest, um, you know, master plan communities in the entire state of Washington, right? And so it might not be realistic for something like that, that, that size and scope to, to be done in 10 years or even, even 20 years. And so again, by, by having the discretion of the council where we can work through this and talk through it, I like that there's a tool here, but it doesn't mean we have to exercise the tool. And I think in reality, the next big development agreement we're going to negotiate is the county campus. And there's likely to be a, a cycle, hopefully not two, in, in that time period. And it's going to be based on real estate excise taxes, how they're going to pay for this thing. And I want it done as fast as possible, but we don't want to have it partway done. And then all of a sudden, the... the uh, Regulations change on them because their their uh, their development agreement is changed expired. So further discussion. I, I never didn't hear a motion out of Council Member Diener, but there was discussion about about that those two ten years extensions. No, I can I can uh, count the vote. Okay, all right. So we're uh, back on this main motion. Further discussion on the main motion. All right, hearing none, you'll be voting on uh, amendments to the Port Orchard Municipal Code, Chapter 20.26, related to two development agreements. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved. We're to item C, adoption of a resolution approving a contract with the South Kitsap School District for COVID-19 uh, relief. Uh, Ms. Archer, this is yours. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, the Washington State Department of Commerce has allocated funding to the City of Port Orchard in a total amount of $647,000. The Mayor has done his darndest to find ways to utilize those funds and allow them to reach uh, members of the public. 
Um, one of those methods is to provide grant funding to the school district, uh, the South Kitsap School District, to reach residents of Port Orchard and to allow them to purchase protective equipment and to purchase uh, um, technology necessary to facilitate distance learning, including Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, by this resolution, the council would authorize funding to the South Kitsap School District from your allocated CARES funding in the total amount of $10,000. I think there's an extra zero uh, on the staff report, apologies, for the purchase of that protective equipment, Wi-Fi hotspots, and related technology, allowing the school to continue to operate remotely um, in accordance with the state mandate, state and federal um, mandated restrictions. Uh, and I'm happy to stand for any questions related to the resolution, the grant, or the contract. Questions or a motion? Councilmember Lucarelli. I move to adopt a resolution declaring a public purpose authorizing a grant award to the South Kitsap School District for COVID-19 relief and authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement with the district in a form acceptable to the city attorney. Second it. A motion by council member Lucarelli and a second by council member Clausen. Any questions for myself or Ms. Archer? So as you can see, we're, we're uh, providing primarily hot spots uh, with this chunk of money to our school district. I know uh, some of the nonprofits have been helping out with, with this uh, type of funding too for the school district. There's a big need out there. Uh, for people that don't have good internet for these Wi-Fi wi hotspots. So with that, uh, you'll be voting on uh, a resolution approving a contract with South Kitsap School Distri District for COVID-19 uh, relief. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the resolution is approved. All right, we're on to item D, adoption of a resolution approving an amendment to contract number 060-20 with Department of Commerce related to the COVID-19 CARES Act funds. Mr. Crocker, this is yours. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as the council is familiar with, uh, the CARES Act was enacted in March 27th, 2020 to provide immediate relief in response to COVID-19. By resolution number 027-20, the city council authorized the mayor to execute an interagency agreement with the Department of Commerce to be eligible for up to $431,700 of CARES Act funding. On August 31st, 2020, Governor Inslee announced an additional allocation of funds for Washington local governments. The city of Port Orchard is eligible for an additional $215,850 of CARES Act funding and an additional time to request reimbursement. Uh, so in costs incurred due to the public health emergency with respect to COVID during the period of March 1st, 2020 through November 30th of 2020 are eligible for reimbursement from the CARES Act funding. Uh, as a result of both the allocations and the additional time, the city portrait is eligible for up to $647,550 of CARES Act funding administered through Department of Commerce. And in order to pursue the additional funds, the city must execute an agreement, an amendment to the interagency agreement with Department of Commerce, again, in the form that required by Department of Commerce. Uh, staff would recommend the city council approve the resolution authorizing the mayor to execute the amendment to the interagency agreement with Department of Commerce relate, related to the CARES Act funding. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, Councilmember Diener. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into the amendment to the interagency agreement with the Department of Commerce related to the COVID-19 CARES Act funds for local governments in Washington State. Second. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Diener, a second by Councilmember Kachardi uh, for the agreement uh, with Commerce to accept the additional funds and also it gives us an additional 30 days of time to uh, seek reimbursement uh, for our on our funding. Any questions for me or for Mr. Crocker? Councilmember Lucarelli? Not a question, but a tiny little Scribner's error in the fourth paragraph, third line, add to combat in order to combat COVID-19. 
That's all. Tiny. There are uh, comments or questions. All right. You'll be voting on uh, adoption of a resolution approving an amendment to the contract number 60-20 with the Department of Commerce related to COVID-19 CARES Act funds. All in favor, please state aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the resolution is approved. We're to item E on our agenda, adoption of a resolution amending resolution number 029-20 to increase the total amount of available grant funding to and to approve an amendment to contract number 06 3-20 with Kitsap Economic Development Alliance for administration of the Port Orchard CARES Small Business Relief Grant Program. Mr. Crocker. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, once again, this resolution is amending our current uh, contract with Kitsap Economic De Development Alliance to broaden and enlarge the Small Business Grant Relief Grant Program. Uh, the mayor has done a really hard worked really hard uh, to deploy the CARES Act funding to our community and as such is successful working with Kita to expand that program. Uh, staff would recommend that we amend this resolution number 0920920 to increase the grant funding for the Port Richard CARES Small Business Relief Grant Program and to authorize an amendment to the agreement with Kita for the program administration costs. I Council move to Chair. adopt resolution amending the Port Orchard Care Small Business Relief Grant Program to increase the total amount of available grant funding, authorizing the mayor to implement the program as amended, and authorizing the mayor to execute an amended contract with the Kitsap Economic Development Alliance for the administration of the program. Do I have a second? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a motion by Councilmember Charity, a second by Councilmember Ashby. And uh, this is uh, we've kind of waited till after the fact those applications are in and that third phase was our most successful and uh, totaling nearly $50,000. So we're uh, just shy of $150,000, 147,542 and uh, almost 35 applications. So I'm very, very uh, proud of the work that's uh, gone into this, this last round of applications after you approve it. Kita still has some work to do and I'm hopeful the last week of the month that uh, I'm out delivering checks for this this round of funding. Um, finance department, our finance department and um, Kita are both ready to be done with CARES and it's been very, very labor intensive. There's a lot of documents that go with all this and Kita right now, uh, you know, they wanted to help, but $100 an application was a bargain uh, for all the paperwork going into this. And they're, they're administering four programs right now, and ours is the smallest uh, of the four. Uh, the county's got a program, Bremerton has a program, and uh, they're also uh, administering a program for commerce. So there's a lot of different grants out there right now. Paulsbo, uh, I don't know how they did it, but they're, they're administering their grants in-house uh, and didn't partner with Kita. Uh, so I'm very thankful for the partnership with Kita because they've done a tremendous amount of work. I, I don't believe we could have done this on our own. This, this, the, the work we've done on our side is uh, tremendous. And I appreciate the, the help by our attorney, Ms. Archer, and Noah and his staff as, as we uh, have deployed these dollars in our community. So with that, any questions or comments related to this program? Councilmember Chang? I want to thank you, the mayor and staff, for going out for the third round. Um, I understand from some business owners that they they were hesitant to apply in the first place, and I was also hearing from some of them they just felt that uh, they felt uncomfortable applying for this money. Uh, so I think that with with the extended um, deadlines, this this really encouraged them to get the support that they need. And I concur with your comment when. Those that were comfortable, I've been very public about sharing stories and pictures and other business members in our community when I deliver the check, they're a bit sheepish about it. They don't want anybody to know that they're in need, but many, our businesses are in need and um, 
you know, I, I had uh, a couple of business owners get teary eyed when, um, and when I, when I hand them a check and, and they were very thankful, appreciative and wanted to tell me and I want to pass on to you uh, how much this means to them uh, in their time of need. So other comments? Thank you, Council Member Chang for, for your question and comment. All right, with that, we'll be voting on uh, the uh, resolution amending and increasing the total amount of grant funding available to with our contract with Kitsap De Development Alliance for our uh, CARES grant relief program. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? The uh, amendment uh, to the resolution has been approved. We are to item F, adoption of a resolution approving a contract with Rice Fergus Miller for the 2020-2021 schematic design, 30% city hall improvement project. Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Your Honor, council members. You can all hear me? Yes. On January 31st and February 7th of 2020, the city's public works department published a request for qualifications or an RFQ for the 2020 2021 ad ready 100% PSE city hall improvement project, which included the schematic 30% and design development 60% phases. By the February 28, 2020 deadline, five statement qualifications were received. On March 10, 2020, upon completion of the mandatory bidder's uh, responsibility checklist and scoring ranking of the five statement qualifications received, city staff selected the top three qualifica uh, qualified firms for interview. On July 22nd and July 23rd, after a COVID-19 related hiatus, city staff interviewed, scored, and then selected Rice Fergus Miller for the project. Public Works staff then met with Rice Fergus Miller to discuss, clarify, and develop the project understanding. And on September 18th, 2020, the city received a defined scope of work budget and project timeline for the schematic only design phase of the project in an amount not to exceed $104,000 plus a reimbursable expense that's estimated at $25,000. Staff recommends adoption of resolution 041-20, thereby approving contract number C075-20 with Rice Fergus Miller for the 2020-2021 schematic city hall improvement project in the amount of $106,500 and documenting the professional services procedures. And I'd like to note as we move from the 30 to the 60 or to the 100, we will not be required to go back out and advertise. We'll be able to work with Rice Fergus Miller because the original advertisement was for the 100%. If you'll remember, uh, go ahead, Councilor Clausen. Uh, I was just going to make a motion, Mayor. If it's, Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt resolution number 041-20, thereby approving contract number C075-20 with Rice Fergus Miller Incorporated for the 2020-2021 schematic 30% city hall improvement project in an amount of $106,500 and documenting the professional services procurement procedure. Second. Motion by Councilmember Claussen, second by Councilmember Lucarelli. If you uh, recall, uh, about four years ago, we did a, uh, a space and needs analysis in, in City Hall, also done by Rice Fergus Miller. And uh, we were on a path to um, potentially add about a third more space onto City Hall, as well as address our weatherization needs. And now COVID's come along and, um, you know, the workplace is different and um, we might, it's likely we won't need this additional space for, for some time. And also the community centers in play and what that could mean for space and uses too. So um, while we can wait on the additional space, we can't wait on the weatherization of the building. I was reminded of that today as I sat in my office this afternoon with the wind blowing, and uh, the window coverings moving back and forth. When the windows are closed, they're not supposed to do that. So uh, the, the, the clock tower, I'm sure the sump pump and the clock tower has been working overtime today. And uh, 
you know, our roof can't, shouldn't leak, our, our windows shouldn't leak, and uh, there's, you know, our siding's in not very good shape. So, you know, we're going to address those needs. We have some electrical needs and related to our generator isn't properly sized for the building. And uh, we have them looking at the possibility of uh, adding solar panels to the building too. So um, this gets us to 30% by the end of the year. And then the budget, uh, the finance committee seen and the rest of you will see soon as I think it's roughly $250,000 to finish that 100% ad ready design and specs uh, so that it's ready sometime in 2021 for then us to have an idea what that's going to cost, uh, develop a, a financing plan, and then potentially put that out to bid. So that's kind of where we're at with this, where, where we were and where we're at today. So questions for me on this, Councilmember Claussen? Just a comment, when Mark read the staff report, he indicated that the plus reimbursable expense estimated that he said 25,000 with the staff reports is 2,500. So just to clarify that. So which is it, Mark? It's 2,500. Did okay. I say 25,000? Yes. You, did. you, oh, you did, but the total amount that we approved is more in line with the 2,500, so. Okay. Yes. Good catch, Good awesome. All right, All right. Council Member Lucarelli. That was question? the same thing I was going to say. Thank you. Same thing. All mm -hmm. right. That's why Mark is an engineer and not the finance director. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm also wearing the glasses that DJ gave me that she got from Walgreens. So <laughs> a few years ago. A long time ago. Yeah, I, I lost my real glasses. So my apologies. <laughs> All right. Other comments or questions? All right, with that, you'll be voting on the adoption of a resolution approving a contract with Rice Fergus Miller for the schematic design uh, at 30% for City Hall Improvement Project. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? I hear none, so the resolution is approved. And so we are to our last business item, which is item G, which are the council meeting minutes. Uh, Looks like we could have put these on the consent agenda because our person that was absent is absent this evening. So, is there a motion to approve the minutes from September 22nd? Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor will we approve the minutes as published? Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right, I have a motion by Council Member Clausen and a second by Council Member Diener to approve the me meeting minutes of September 22nd. Any further discussion of those meeting minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes, please state aye. Aye. Is there anyone opposed? And I don't believe there are any abstentions either. So minutes are approved. All right, uh, discussion items, biennial budget. I think we tackled the uh, meeting schedule on the 26th, I think it was, or 28th? 28th. 28th. Is there anything else you wanna add for the discussion item, Noah? No, I, th I think we covered everything for this meeting. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Um, council committee reports. Finance committee, uh, you met, uh, discussed the budget here recently. I'm not sure if we've had a council meeting since then. No, that just basically the committee did meet. I think it was on the 5th, if I remember correctly, and uh, pretty much devoted the entire meeting to the information that uh, Noah shared, as well as, you know, just quick uh, outline of the budget and some of the uh, areas that we'll all be discussing here soon. So that's pretty much the report for the finance committee. Okay. And economic development has been rescheduled now. It looks like it's on October 26th at 8 a.m. And uh, utility committee, have you're meeting on October 20th. That's next week. So I doubt that you have a report, correct? And our previous, after our previous meeting, we, the most important thing was the sewer CFCs, which we tackled already. Perfect. And sewer advisory committee, do you have a, a meeting date yet or not? Yes, November 18th, 6.30 PM. Perfect. Uh, land use, is there a, a report from you? 
Yes, um, we met on October 7th at 4.30. Uh, we, were, we were fully, well, I guess uh, uh, Councilmember Chang was absent, but uh, we had a, uh, an update on the Parks Rec open space plan survey, survey results. Um, the analysis of those results wasn't yet conducted or presented, um, but we, we did review or had the opportunity to review lots of data that was collected. Uh, we also reviewed the development agreement ordinance that was presented tonight. We also discussed some Title 20 housekeeping uh, ordinance changes. Those are the kinds of changes that you realize after you've been running with a title for a while, you realize, realize that there are certain things that need to be corrected or changed. So we'll see that soon. Um, we also had a preview of some potential 2021 comprehensive plan amendments. Um, and I won't go into a lot of detail on those, but just know that they're coming. And then we also had a preview of, but didn't really talk about uh, the initial draft of the downtown and county campus sub area plan prospects. So that's what the meeting was about. Any questions? Hearing none, thank you for your report. Council Member Chang. Oh, we just wanted to mention that the next meeting is actually at 4.30 instead of 9.30 as listed on the agenda. And I apologize for missing the other one. I didn't show up in my calendar since the last iOS update. So I was fixing that today. So I have all entries back in my calendar. I love technology. All right, Transportation Committee, I see you're going to meet on the 27th of this month here uh, two weeks from tonight. And lodging tax, Clerk Reinerson, do you have anything to report since Council Member Rose Pepe is not here tonight? Um, staff did open up the application process for um, lodging tax participants who want to um, seek reimbursement through lodging tax funds through the council. Um, at, the um, at the direction of the council, we are opening it up only to tours and marketing at this time. And then after the new year, you guys will look at the revenue that came in to determine if we're going to open it up to the tourism um, festivals and events. Um, so I have received two applications so far that closes tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, the committee should be meeting next week or the week of the 26th to get together to hear the presentation from the applicants as well as deliberate and provide a recommendation to the council. So hopefully um, either the 27th or the first meeting in November, you should have a recommendation before you from the lodging tax committee. Okay, thank you for the update. Festival of Chimes and Lights, Cindy? Yes, so what we have done is prepared a um, utilities billing insert to clarify what the event will be this year and what it won't be. And most of any anything that has to do with public gatherings will not be happening. Um, so we're going to have the tree, um, the tree decorating contest, lots of light displays. And now we're going to actually be having a 5K virtual run um, but most of our activities will be postponed until next year. Right. So our next meeting is in a week. So we're just having a different Christmas. Yes. <laughs> Lots of lights. Lots of lights though, that's right. So on the outside agencies, I've got a couple and I'm sure Councilmember Ashby's got one too. So uh, transit board meeting uh, last week, I know we got a presentation a couple of months ago about uh, their preferred alternatives related to the park and ride lot uh, that transit has been uh, studying. And uh, the top two alternatives were our dump site in the industrial park. And the other one was the uh, within our Ruby Creek sub area and the transit board uh, uh, voted on Tuesday, last Tuesday to accept the consultant's recommendation uh, for the Ruby to is our preferred alternative as the Ruby Creek uh, site and uh, transit will continue to uh, to evaluate that to do further analysis to determine that is the uh, the correct site to build that like 240 250 car park and ride lot um, within that uh, Ruby, Ruby Creek uh, sub area. So I just wanted to, to share that with you. Uh, also today at 
for transit. I participated in the uh, state auditor's entrance conference and I had participated in the Gorst uh, coalition meeting today. Uh, they are looking to hire a dedicated lobbyist for up to $10,000 a month. Can you, considering we pay our lobbyist $3,800 that uh, uh, I had the same reaction you guys did. I saw a lot of eyebrows go up and uh, um, they were looking for people to write checks today, matter of fact, almost. And uh, I uh, offered uh, the assistance of our lobbyist and uh, as uh, some of us did, uh, asked for maybe a work plan and a budget to be, a, be a developed and uh, maybe the, the, I think it's more realistic that the private sector um, fund a lobbyist if one is needed for this and that uh, the government, uh, us, the county and Bremerton have lobbyists and maybe we contribute our lobbyists, but uh, you're, the, you're the council and uh, you control the budget. So uh, I will bring the request back to you when I get the formal request, but uh, um, just sharing what I, what I learned today. And uh, see here, KRCC, I know there's been a request uh, for uh, some questions uh, for you guys to review some questions to, that will be asked of our dele delegation on, at the reception on November 12th. And I don't think we've seen any responses yet. So if you've got uh, questions you'd like to see asked, um, I know uh, we'd love to, to hear from you. So uh, with that, those are my reports. Councilmember Ashby, do you have anything? And then I see Councilmember Claussen. What I would add is, or what I was going to mention, is the legislative reception will be via Zoom this year, and it is November 12th. <clears throat> Other thing, the Peninsula RPTO has put together, and we'll be finalizing this Friday, um, a outline of educational and informational pieces to our legislative delegations. And so, the RPTO has scheduled um, meetings with the 24th Legislative District on October 28th. We will be working with the 23rd and 26th on, um, I believe it's November 5th, and we will be meeting with the 35th also on November um, 5th. So, all of our groups right now are busy educating our legislators for the upcoming session and letting them know what things are of particular concern and of importance to us. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Ashby. Councilmember Clausen, I saw you raise your hand. Yes, I just wanted to add to your uh, comments on the uh, Gorse Coalition. I think the group is developing a proposed budget, which I think will give us better data and information on exactly what uh, their expenditures are anticipated to be. And also that um, whomever is selected and hired uh, would be responsible for not only informing uh, and advocating for this project with state, but it's gonna be federal delegations as well. I would also share that uh, Congressman Kilmer was on the call and shared uh, some activities that are going on in Washington, D.C. regarding allocation of funding. Now, as we all know, there's lots of negotiations that are um, underway back in D.C. and with the upcoming election, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, his prediction was that right after the first of the year, he believes that there's going to be a infrastructure package approved uh, back in DC to help with, uh, I guess, stirring the economy and, and getting the economy back rolling again. And he sees that a fair amount of effort is going to be devoted towards highway and bridge improvements and things of that nature. So I think there's lots of things that are going on with this Gorst project, it's expensive. Uh, I think the estimated amount right now, if I'm not mistaken, mayor is what about $425 million is what's being envisioned for a solution there. 
And the only other thing I would add is this is the first time that I've seen the Navy actively involved in solving a transportation issue outside of their gates. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot more to this effort right now than some of the rhetoric that's been going on with past efforts. So I, looking through my rose colored glasses, I, I'm hopeful that we will come up with some kind of a, a solution to this problem that we can actually move forward with. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks for adding on. We'll uh, go to the mayor's report. I, uh, we've got a, a survey for the community center out to our community. We're in the second week and it closes on Friday. Please take it and ask others to take it. it uh, we're asking our community what type of uses and amenities they want to see in in the community center and uh, so far we've seen 500 responses already which i think is is really good and uh, but i see i'd like to see 500 more by the end of the week if we could so uh, if you haven't taken the survey please do and encourage others to do so uh, the chief talked to me yesterday about uh, a practice that we had uh, related to police vacation requests, meaning that people call the police department and say, hey, I'm going on vacation or I'm in, headed to Arizona for the next three months and I want you to come by and, and take a look at our, you know, check on our house. And based on our staffing levels, that's just really not realistic. And secondly, our, in the world of public, public records we're in, do you really want us to have a, rec, a, a list around of all the people that aren't home uh, for the month of uh, November uh, around City Hall? So um, I think that presents some liability in itself. So the chief and I have talked about, we're gonna discontinue that practice. I think the best thing for folks, if you're gonna be out of town for a few days, let your neighbors know. Um, you know, maybe you should have an alarm system. Uh, they've gotten a lot cheaper now with uh, some of the technology that's out there. But uh, so I just wanted to share that with folks. Um, Bay Street pedestrian path. I think if you've seen a press release and you saw a little blurb in our in the newsletter that went out last week, uh, we have reengaged our right of way agent for property acquisitions on the pathway. Uh, the property owners should be hearing uh, from our right of way agent in the next few weeks. Title reports and appraisals are being order, offer, ordered at this time. And I think property owners should start receiving offers shortly after the first of the year. So I just wanted to publicly announce that so that everybody knows what's going on and what we're doing. And uh, exciting news on the employment front, uh, we have posted a building inspector position and uh, they conducted interviews last week and our own Doug Price, uh, who is our code enforcement officer, um, who has been working to get some of those certifications is uh, now been offered and accepted that job. And so he recognizes that he will need to do double duty about half and half until we get his replacement hired and I saw late this afternoon a uh, an updated job description for Mr. Price's uh, former job for code enforcement offer that officer that I'll look at tomorrow and hopefully we can get at that on the street very quickly and that's all I have uh, let's see here uh, department heads Mr. Crocker do you have anything else besides the budget uh, no, I have nothing else tonight. Thank you. Okay. Pretty budget centric. Uh, let's see here. Mr. Bond. Well, I had three announcements, but you made all of them for me. So um, <laughs> I'm just going to supplement them by saying that next week at work study, uh, we will have Rice Fergus Miller presenting to the council uh, to give you an update on where we're at with the community event center project. Um, and uh, concerning Mr. Price being selected for the building inspector position, you know, we, uh, we talked about adding a second building inspector before COVID really hit back in February. And between February and June, he went and passed all of his tests to get all these certifications. So it was sort of a, a surprise that he had the certifications. And then when he interviewed, um, it, it made me realize just how valuable he is to the city because of the broad skill set that he has. So I think he's going to be a really good uh, fit and he's got uh, really good customer service skills, and I think he will be an asset to the building department going forward. And uh, but I hate to lose a good code enforcement officer, so um, 
uh, that job description, by the way, that for code enforcement is being updated slightly. The educational and experience requirements are being tweaked. And so the city council will be asked to approve those uh, next at their next regular meeting at the end of the month here. Um, so hopefully we can get your support and get that job posted. Okay. All right, Chief Brown. Uh, yeah, I just have a couple things for council. So thank you, Mayor. Uh, we're continuing to do really good work on accreditation. We're about 40% uh, done uh, with, with uh, some of the low hanging fruit, the things that we're already doing that we just need to uh, apply proofs to. Uh, mostly what we're experiencing is uh, for some of the delays or just issues of training and then our property room. Uh, the next uh, item I wanted to advise uh, council on is we started our strategic advisory board last Thursday. Um, this was a, a plan that we've been working on since about November of last year and then COVID hit and made, made gatherings a little bit more difficult. Um, so the, the idea behind the strategic advisory board is to help us to develop our strategic plan, which is a three to five year plan of uh, what the community and the electeds uh, and the city want the police department to look like, what they want us to focus on. Um, I've already had an opportunity to sit down with uh, Council Member Chang, and I intend to do with, with, uh, the same with the rest of you to hear from you individually. Um, so our board is, is a representative group of the community. It has nine members. Uh, it represents education, business, faith-based, uh, the military, and at large. Uh, all nine members have very, very deep roots in the community and either continue to live within the city limits or uh, operate businesses within the city limits. Um, and we are having that facilitated for us by Steve Strand, who is the executive director of Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Uh, some of you may also remember him. He was the chief of Bremerton and he was the uh, King County Sheriff for a short period of time. Uh, he's also the chief of Kent. Um, we anticipate three meetings, a total of three meetings. So probably by mid-November, uh, we'll have that portion of our plan wrapped up. Again, I'm hoping to speak with all of you individually to include the department heads, uh, the sheriff and the other municipal chiefs. Um, and I'll tell you this too, I mean, even with, with everything that's going on, it was an incredibly, incredibly positive meeting. Um, I think that we can all agree that even with all the, the things going on with our society right now, especially as it has to do with policing, um, in criminal justice, uh, the majority of us agree, agree on about 90%, and, and uh, that's where we're going with this group. It's, it's incredible. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping will come out of this, and I've asked them to make the recommendation, is a uh, community advisory board, um, which would be uh, an ongoing project, probably meeting quarterly. So something very similar to a town hall uh, or a, an ask me anything where I can come and present to the community what we've been doing over the last quarter, and then they have the ability to ask me whatever questions that they would like. So I can answer anything that you might have, or otherwise that's all I have for updates. Question for the chief. I, th I think it's great that we're doing, taking this step to engage with our community and, and ask them what they want their police department to look like. So I appreciate the effort that's going on there. So Mr. Dorsey, nothing? Okay. Got enough going on in public works? Plenty. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We, got, we got plenty. Got plenty going on? All right. Well, I won't look for anything else then. Ms. Archer? Yeah. If Brandy would stop doing accepting public records requests and if Charlotte wouldn't keep wrangling up lawsuits, it'd be awesome. Okay. Well, thank we'll, you. We'll put <laughs> Checking the mail then, I think that's- Mark, I think you just got the evil eye for Brandy, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Uh, very briefly, the governor, as you all know, has extended uh, proc the proclamation with regards to the uh, Open Public Meetings Act and the Public Records Act suspensions with regards to in-person meeting. Um, that has been extended to November 9th. Um, the other relevant uh, proclamation that's been extended for municipalities uh, has to do with the utility prohibition and the, the prohibition on disconnection of utility fees. That is only currently in effect until October 15th, um, but I believe we're expecting a further extension um, if they can get the four corners to agree. Uh, KITSAP remains in phase 
two, I believe. Um, so reopening of City Hall is still suspended until um, you move to phase three. Happy to answer any questions about any of that. We're wearing the stickers off the floor that nobody's walked on besides staff that tell everybody to stay six feet apart. That's okay, we've got more. We'll just replace them. Yeah. Quick, Reinerson. Um, just two things. We're getting closer to the public portal for documents. Um, that's moving along. Should have something up on the site here, the website, probably in the next couple weeks. And then the other thing is I participated in the AWC RMSA online annual meeting this year. And the city, because I participated, will receive a $500 scholarship for safety improvements. Um, typically, we purchase the um, crosswalk flags with those dollars. Um, the other thing that we had also at that meeting is the operation committee elections. And I was up for a re-election this year. So I've been um, accepted or um, voted in for my third term as the city's representative for the operating committee for our Association of Washington Cities. So that's all I have. So Glenn, Grant, Glenn, Grant Brandy glazed over that, that portal really quickly. That's a big deal. Uh, we, to be able to have a portal, and this is where this laser fish tool that we're, we're developing and the electronic records are going to be so important to be able to direct someone as, as we can get all as many of our records as we can in this portal, we can direct people to that versus the tremendous amount of staff time that Mr. Dorsey and Brandy and Charlie um, are, we're spending, I think we've spent We've estimated over $100,000 this year in staff time uh, on public records requests. So um, that's that's a big number and a lot of staff time. And uh, they're the public records. They're entitled to them. And they ought to be able to access them. And we're creating a, a mechanism for them to be able to get to uh, as many as, you know, we're, gonna, we're working towards getting everything we can uh, on that platform. So uh, hats off to Brandy, Noah, our IT department uh, and everybody that's working on that initiative because it's a big deal. So that is it for staff and anything for the good of the order council. Councilmember Lucarelli. So given that we aren't having very much for chimes and lights, decorating a tree downtown is really important this year and we have fewer businesses actually in business to do that. So I'm encouraging the council to once again, sponsor a tree and any business or individual who wants to sponsor a tree to please sign up. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for the request. Others, anything for the good of the order? I'm glad everybody, Brandy and I were fretting a little bit as the power was flickering today, whether uh, you'd be uh, blipping in and out, but uh, I'm glad to see everybody made it and we made it through the meeting tonight. So with that, we are adjourned. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.